Hi, my name is Brent Hodge. I'm the director and executive producer of Viagra, the pill that changed the world. We were interested in hypertension. We decided to do a 10-day study in male volunteers at the maximum tolerated dose. I don't know what's going on with my heart, but my penis is certainly liking this thing. It was a medical breakthrough. Viagra. 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 The sex genie was out of the bottle. It was a cultural phenomenon. The project went from dead to number one. It was everywhere, ABC, CBS, CNN. You're dealing with the most controversial area of human society. A brand name drug that is absolutely lucrative. Double locks on everything to prevent theft. Will this lead to a new sexual revolution? Cheap gas, strong economy, erection pills, what a time to be alive. <laughs> are forever and there's nothing harder than a diamond to me and you it's sex but it's not sex my friend it's a revolution hello i'm sonia Winesett, and this is an episode of filmmaker focus today we're interviewing brent hodge director of the docuseries viagra the little blue pill that changed the world hi brent thanks for joining us yeah thanks for having me sonia Let's dive in. What an interesting three-part docuseries. What was the initial spark for Viagra, the little blue pill that changed the world? Well, I did a documentary series on, on Martin Shkreli. He's the, the guy who raised the price of Daraprim. And, and, and we, we really did sort of an interesting comedic dive into pharmaceuticals and thought, you know, what could our next one be? And, and we teamed up with October Films. They'd had this idea we had different people off of NDAs at Pfizer from the time. And we thought, let's, let's go in. How come no one's done a documentary on Viagra? Um, brought it to D+. Howard Schwartz immediately wanted this film. And, and, and there we went. We went on a, a journey through the 90s to find out uh, the ups and downs, pun intended, of, of Viagra, which was a lot of fun. So, Brent, can you talk about your sort of unique perspective and style as a documentary filmmaker? Sure. I mean, especially for this one, there's always like an element of pop culture that I want to get into each film. 1999, uh, Eiffel 65 Blue was the number one song on the Billboard charts. So before I even started, that was the first thing I knew I wanted in this film is, is the opening title sequence. Uh, it's kind of like, if you know, you know. This is one of those songs. And then we knew we needed to have Blue, like in every title, Every interview, it's either a sweater of blue or somebody has blue. I just, I love the idea of blue taking over your entire iris of your eye as you're watching this thing. And it worked and I just love it. It kind of gets you into, like, I, I want to hit people, make sure they remember that moment. Like 1999, 2000, so many of my stories, for whatever reason, for whatever reason they gravitate towards these, this, the millennial. I, I really don't know why. Maybe one day I'll figure it out. But I do know that a lot of fascinating stuff happened during that time. And it's a nostalgic moment when this pill came out. And I just wanted people to relive it again because we all went through it. So, Brent, you specialize in comedy and pop culture documentaries. How is Viagra um, in line with your previous films, despite its kind of odd you know, pharmaceutical <laughs> subject? And how is it different from your previous films? Well, I think... The comedy is 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 pretty in your face. It's it's right there. I don't know how many boner jokes you can you can get into a film, but we did it. But you know, the more I kind of worked around where this story starts, it fits in a really interesting time in the naughty '90s, as we call it, and uh, it, it became quite a serious subject as we started going through and realizing, oh wow, we've been marketed uh, in a really unique way about Viagra. We've made sex all about the male organ. Uh, why isn't there a female Viagra? And so the, the story gets deeper. With our films, we, we always have like a, a, a saying, which is, if you can make them laugh, you can make them listen. And in this case, it followed that. And that's what, what sort of made it a Haji film, in our opinion. And in the process of researching your subject, how did the film begin to take shape in your mind? I mean, you could have chosen from any number of lenses to tell this story. Like, how did you decide this is the way that I'm going to approach it? Well, David Friend, he's a, he's a guy who wrote the book, The Naughty 90s, and there's a whole chapter on Viagra, 
And that was a very much became our Bible. And he's in the film. We interview him. But we really felt that the way he kind of started from the beginning of, of Pfizer coming up with this miracle drug out of nowhere and then it moving into the marketing phase of it. And by the year 2000 hits, this thing's the biggest pill in the world. This was the perfect time to launch. Everyone was looking at the internet that is sort of a portal to sexuality. This had never happened before. People young and old would go to the internet for sex. Now this was diff this was new. The place is oversexed, overdrugged, over <laughs> over romanced. What happens in 1998? In January of 1998, Bill Clinton says, "I did not have sexual relations with that woman." Even the president's getting it on. What's going on with you guys? We sort of love the life and times of Viagra. And, you know, pun intended, yet again, what goes up must come down. You can see as the, as the, uh, as the field of, of uh, drugs for impotency sort of increased, you can sort of see how Viagra sort of gets washed out. So we really wanted to follow the life and times of something that, that, you know, really put itself on the map and made it big. You asked the question, was the world ready for Viagra? Can you talk about how current events, pop culture, and social norms at the time played a huge role in Viagra's reception and success? You know, what's, what I found really interesting is that prior to Viagra, there was no pill for impotency. There was no pill for erectile dysfunction. And the, the solutions they had before were, uh, you know, really, like, what's the right term? Like, um, they were uncomfortable, really. So when a pill came out, we, we, I don't think we ever took that moment to understand that this is on the front page of Time Magazine, this is on the front page of People, and every news outlet, it really blew up. Jay Leno was making 100 jokes a night of this thing, but jokes aside, there was one out of eight men who had problems with impotency and, and weren't telling their doctor. Um, when a pill came, you know, it, it kind of changed everything. So... As much as there's a pop culture element to it, you know there is a there is an issue, uh, an underlying it, which, which I think a lot of people felt more comfortable bringing up all of a sudden. Your sexual identity is focused around your erection. If you're a guy, that's what we've been taught. Put yourself in the place of the guy who has a D. His male identity is gone. His sexual identity is gone. His relationship with his partner is gone because all of those things were predicated on the fact that this guy could get an erection. You're not really a man if your penis doesn't work. Then what are you? I mean, you can't even get that right. You only have one thing to do, <laughs> and you can't do it, you know? And that was how it was treated for a long time, that you're basically irrelevant. Can you um, go into some of the specifics of um, the other solutions prior to the pill, which, you know, it was incredible. They call it the miracle pill because it's easy, it works, and it was readily available, uh, you know, once it launched out into the world. But can you talk about some of the more primitive um, solutions with people with uh, erectile dysfunction? Yeah, I mean, it's not pretty. It's different forms of pumps, different forms of surgeries. Um, most were difficult, take a while, were, uh, you know, very urologist specialized, uh, cost a lot and painful. There was a, a recognized medical need for a treatment for erectile dysfunction, but erectile dysfunction had been kind of overlooked. There were treatments out there for it and people were using them. They were horrible treatments. At that time, there were intracavernosal injections. So that's an injection in a man's penis. You had to stick the needle in your penis, inject the drug into your penis, rub the penis, wait usually five minutes, and you would have an erection. Intraurethral suppositories. So that's a pellet that is pushed through the urethra. A pellet in the urethra is easier to administer than a uh, injection in the penis. And there were vacuum constriction devices and also penile implant surgery. You went to see your urologist and he would operate on you and implant essentially a balloon with a little push button right here. When you were ready for sex, you pressed the button and it literally inflated your penis 
you had sex, and then you pushed the button and it went back down. There was a high prevalence, an unmet need, and a role to play for pharmacologic therapies that would be widely, not only effective, but widely attractive to these vast number of men that were not seeking help because they were disinterested in what was available. The holy grail of sexual medicine is to find a pill, take only when you want it, it's highly effective, it's highly safe, very few people in medicine ever have the experience of finding the holy grail of their specialty. Why do you think male virility and sexual identity are so focused on a man's ability to have an erection? This is what was the, probably the biggest learning curve for me in this film. You know, I got in because it's comedic and it's fun. And if I could think of any pharmaceutical uh, thing that I want to play off of, it's Viagra. We all sort of see it in pop culture. Little did I know how much it affects men, um, and little did I know how how sort of how conflicted it is with the fact that there is no women Viagra, and how we have made the male organ such an element of marketing sex. It's the most important thing in sex, and we all know that to not be that true. The irony of a pill that's meant to enhance sex is that. It's created this expectation that the only way to have sex successfully is with an erection. So it's kind of reduced all the colors of the rainbow. I don't know where it came from. I don't know if it's just easy marketing. I don't know if people just pulled that out of marketing. But either way, it's something we wanted to make sure we touched on in this film. A lot of episode three is about why there is no female Viagra. And we really grilled the, the science team on that. The chemists and everybody at Pfizer, why didn't you go further? Why didn't you do this? Why have we not? Why have we not been able to? Was there ever an attempt to create a female version, the pink pill? There were certainly discussions, basically saying, "Well, what is female dysfunction? You know, wh what mechanism would we follow?" But nothing seems to have emerged. There was actually a researcher who said, "Well, we can't make it too strong." Otherwise, all the women will want it and go crazy. It's like we have our blinders on when it comes to women's bodies. In men, it's pretty simple to determine if you have an erection or not. But exploring arousal and orgasm is difficult in women. It's complex. There's just been much less research and investment investigating women's concerns about pleasure and desire. So it's all in that film. Episode three is something we really focus on, uh, what we call where's the pink pill is the section of the film. Do you think, do you agree that the women's movement uh, may have led to hypermasculinity, including macho overcompensation and posturing? Yeah, I think it comes earlier. This is a lot of David Friend's work, which he did with the Naughty 90s in talking through a lot of this. There's one incredible story that didn't make the film, which was, you know, the year 2000, when this pill is launching, Clinton is talking about an affair in the White House and things are happening. The other thing that's going on is the biggest bat competition, as we called it, Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa, hitting all the home runs as they're pumping steroids into their bodies to see how, how long and how far that bat can take them. And we just, I always found that to be something that I wish we could have gotten into this film because it, it, it's sort of like culturally, we might not even know it's happening. From the 90s, you've got men overcompensating by all these phallic symbols in their lives. You saw men smoking cigars. There were cigar bars. It was a big thing. You saw guys buying big golf clubs, these huge metal heads on these titanium shafts. I mean, you tell me what that means. The macho overcompensation and posturing was sort of crazy because men were feeling at sea. All of this plays into masculinity and the fear that it's just not enough. It didn't pack the punch, it once did, and we needed something more. Viagra came out at a time when the culture was sort of ready for it. When finally, in 1998, they bring this little blue pill to market, it's a miracle drug. But it is around us, and, and absolutely, there's a there's a there's a masculine, something we're hanging on to. There's something in marketing. Um, it's it's all in there to, to make this be a perfect moment for why Viagra launched so fast and launched 
so so you know readily and in, in, in across the world was so wanted um it all factors in and that, that's sort of the cultural element that is fascinating can you talk about some of the people you interviewed for this project and why they were integral to the story you wanted to tell we were so fortunate that you know a lot of people came out of the woodwork for this it's been 15 20 years since they were off of their pfizer ndas a lot of Pfizer employees, head of marketing, head of science, head of chemistry, um, everyone, you know, once we started doing a few interviews, more and more trickled through. So we were really lucky to get people that were actually there at the time, not just like a journalist who, who wrote about it, but, you know, the actual people to talk about the science compound and then talk about an actual marketing strategy. Sex is actually the hardest thing to sell. It's actually the hardest by far. And the reason is because everybody thinks it's easy to sell. If sex is easy to sell, tell me a successful sex product. I'm waiting. No, 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 take your time. No, 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 really, no rush. I can tell you a successful car. I can tell you a successful pen. I can tell you a successful water. Many people have a weird relationship with sex and sexuality. Everyone has an opinion about who should be having sex and when and how often and with whom. Everybody does. For the Christian right, sex is dangerous. Sex will ruin you. The sex should only happen in the context of procreative, monogamous, marital relationships between heterosexuals. It's in the bedroom. Sex is such a loaded topic. It's so intimate, it's so personal. However, it's also a way to control culture. You're dealing with the most controversial area of human society. Are we about to risk the entire company on this brand? Are we going to just be known as the blue pill failure guys? And then you're asking me to go make this successful? Please. It's impossible. Rooney, he, he's, yeah, he was the head of marketing at that point. He gave us like a, a full box of old VHS tapes of all the sales tapes and how they would, we're going to market this out to the world different numbers, different news articles. So we're extremely lucky. Um, and then we took a lot of cultural side of things. We, did, we interviewed David Friend, who wrote the Naughty 90s book, talking about how it was the birth of sex tapes and scandals. And you're talking the same year that, that, uh, that President Clinton uh, came out about, uh, about sex in the White House. And so it, it, was, it was sort of like the right moment in time, and we wanted to get that culturally, but then we also wanted to make sure we get the science part of things as well. So we had no problem interviewing. There was, there was no one that said no that we wanted. But you also interviewed, uh, say, someone like Aaron Canada, in, you know, who's a Viagra user, and he was very candid about his erectile dysfunction. Was it challenging to get him to participate and open up about his condition on camera? Yeah, I mean, Aaron Canada was, he was a very hard on his sleeve guy. He's talked about this publicly before. He does talks and and. and you know, different speeches and is also, uh, you know, writes about it online. So he was a great subject to talk through this because a lot of men don't want to talk about ED and erectile dysfunction and, and how it affects their everyday life. Aaron was the, was the perfect um, representative of that for us in this film. I was a bit of a late bloomer when it came to sex and sexuality. I don't want to say I was a conservative kid. I was more of a shy kid, so I never really tried anything with anybody. I had girlfriends and dated and stuff like that. Nothing really serious, just the you know high school stuff. Around the time I was 16 or 17 is when I first noticed the problem. The night that sticks out the most, it was like an after prom thing, and this girl who we were hanging out with, she took a liking to me, I took a liking to her. We went back to my house because my house was empty that weekend. She and I went upstairs. I was a virgin at the time, and so we were, you know, planning on getting to it, and nothing's happening. And I mean, she was a beautiful girl, and she's naked, and she's like, and absolutely nothing's happening. Any guy who's got healthy sexual function your first time is like, you can't hold it back. And it was the total opposite for me. It was a lot of like, what is this? I don't like this. Why is this happening? You know, I've had pretty strong anxiety my whole life. So I thought, okay, maybe I'm just really nervous and that's why, and maybe this won't be an ongoing problem. 
but it ended up being an ongoing problem. And he's a young guy too. I think people assume that ED is something that, that you know, as soon as you're in your 70s and 80s, then it happens. But no, it can happen. You know, for for him, it's through anxiety. Um, he was he was a great great advocate for it all. And he also, you know, lent a different perspective to, you know, the people that were directly involved with Pfizer, the experts. So I think, it, you know, I thought it was really interesting that you threaded, you know, Aaron's interview through all uh, three episodes. Did any one participant make an impression on you? And if so, why? Art Kaplan was one of my favorite interviews. Art Kaplan is, uh, he was hired by Pfizer at the time in the late 90s to essentially look over the ethics of what Viagra could and couldn't do. My name's Art Kaplan, and the role I had was to think of what ethical problems, what challenges could arise that might get in the way of getting this drug out to the world. What your drug could do, where it could go wrong, who gets left out. It really was the first instance medical ethics drove a major shift in how we thought about sexuality. It's called Viagra. 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 How did you get the name Viagra? What's the shape of the pill? We don't even know how many men have impotence. What do we have here? When can I get it? Who's going to prescribe it? It might sound too good to be true. There were people standing on the Senate floor saying, what is this? We're going to be enabling rapists. We're going to be enabling sex offenders, because now they have this super pill. And so he called it all out. He said, this could potentially be an issue when it comes to the pornography industry. This could potentially be an issue when it comes to jokes out in pop culture in the media. Um, what is the insert gonna say? What are religious folks gonna say? And he went through sort of each and every problem back then. So they were equipped for it. And I'd say his list of potential red flags have been all been hit in the last 20 years. Every single one has kind of had its avenue. And so. For me, Art Kaplan, I think he saw sort of like the, the clouds before the storm and, and saw them from a distance, and he was able to like equip the Pfizer team uh, with what they needed to know, and, and then you know it, it, it all happened, so they were ready. Let's go back to Rooney Nelson, the uh, former Pfizer marketing director for the U.S. I mean, he was given this daunting task of launching a product that he didn't even think would be approved by the FDA. Can you talk about how Rooney was surprised himself by Viagra's immediate success? Yeah, Rooney has this great story in the film uh, about the black box warning. If you have a drug that has a black box warning, and in this case, Viagra, um, with nitrates is can be deadly. Uh, and so he was he was saying, we, if we have a black box warning about how our product could potentially kill someone, we're dead in the water. There's no chance that this can even be launched. <laughs> when we heard that, everybody looked, and we all just started packing our bags. All right, let's go home now. This is not gonna fly. This truck's dead. It's dead on arrival. No pun intended. So we're done. No one's gonna use this drug. So on the physical package insert, it's in a big black box, which is like, this is really important. And I go, David, it's a black box warning, my friend. No drug is OK with that. And it's like a death now. You try your best to avoid black box warnings. Successful drugs with black box warnings are almost unheard of. David goes, we're going to market the fact that you should never take Viagra with nitrates. And I sit up and I go, well, just to make sure I understand this, David, because I, I want to make sure I didn't miss school this day. We want to make it really clear that this cannot be used with that, because, you know, ultimately Pfizer would have to own that. Then we wanted to be conservative and err on the side of caution. David, what you're telling me is you want us to lead with, don't take Viagra if you have nitrate. I love you to death, but this may be the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. And clearly, you just don't know what you're talking about. At the end of the day, we're pharmaceutical employees. Patient safety is job one, two, and three. Just so you know, that's never happened in pharmaceutical marketing before. David, you spend all your time trying to figure out how to not talk about your side effects. You're throwing away everything. We can't do this. And David's like, we can, we're going to. And I said, 
Okay. Because you just send it to the FDA and you pray. And you hope that they think it's serious enough and important enough that they'll approve it. I remember it was a Saturday and the core team, we had all met in the office and we knew it was gonna be that day that we were gonna hear from the FDA. And it's a fax machine. <laughs> we're looking at this fax machine. Laying on the floor, all of us staring at this fax machine for hours and hours. And I went around the room and I asked everybody in the room, what do you think is gonna happen? Like, is this gonna be a success or a failure? And then they came to me and I said, if we get approved and we don't get pulled, I think it'll be one of the greatest drugs ever. But it's a big if. There is no real appeal process if the FDA says no. The final say is with them. That's it. There's no big stamp. There's no ceremony. They don't call you in and hand you a diploma. It's you sitting around staring at a fax machine. Then. The facts came. So do we have a product? It's like 40 pages. We are approved. We looked around the room and we went, holy may God be with us, because we're going to need it now. I think they always knew it could be big, but um, every one of these jokes, uh, every time Jay Leno said something about Viagra, uh, they were they were always nervous. The marketing team didn't like give a hooray and say, "Oh wow, everybody's talking about us." They're like, "They're going to pull us. At the FDA is going to pull us if they think this is true." So I think it was a pretty nerve wracking couple years for Rooney, but now he looks back at it at it with you know a ton of joy. The media touted Viagra as stage two of the sexual revolution. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that, that was that was the stuff that was scaring Rooney and Nelson and, and, and Janice and, and the team at Pfizer is that, you know, they put a lot into a pill. Um, sexual revolution, like these are marketing terms that were really scaring them. There was this sort of second sexual revolution in the 90s. Technology entered the picture. So you have an oversexed culture. In some ways, the 90s represented this real push towards greater sexual expression, greater experimentation. The sex genie was out of the bottle. We couldn't put it back in. That's right on the front of some of these magazines. And uh, it hadn't even come out yet. This is all happening in the May of 1998 and hadn't even launched in America by that point. So whether, whether it's true or not, I mean, I don't know. I was, I was, I was a lot younger at that time, but whether it has, ha I don't even know if you can call it a sexual revolution, but it definitely, definitely was picked up that way in, in the media. Despite Pfizer's effort to take control of the brand and marketing, uh, they recruited Bob Dole, who was like sort of the face of respectable sexuality. Uh, Viagra still became a party drug. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, this was the Art Kaplan uh, ethics elements of it, knowing that this was probably going to go down a party route. How and why it happened, I'm not too sure. But the problem of counterfeits became a huge deal. Uh, this is where the party drugs came in. It's, it's, it's non-prescription versions of Viagra that are being handed out at parties. You have to remember, the 90s was, you know, we were having this explosion of party culture. Well, part of being in the club was really a lot of the unspoken sex and drugs. And so Viagra helps many men maintain an erection when they're taking other drugs. E, you had Coke, you had Viagra. It was all part of the chemical cocktail of the evening. The FDA assumes that pharmaceutical companies have a lot of control. When you have a drug where there is a larger interest in it, like Viagra, it's like, oh, cool, there's a drug for erections? I 
you know, and so you get the double whammy of being highly regulated and completely out of control. I mean, nobody sits around and experiments with drugs for high blood pressure <laughs> that I'm aware of anyway. Maybe there are parties, I'm just missing them. But, uh. I think it just gets you going. I don't think it keeps you going. Um, what if I told you it did? <laughs> it did? No. Excuse me, I have a pharmacy to go to. <laughs> it's fascinating because I would say it's probably used in partying more now than it is as a prescription. Um, but, it, you know, they knew it was coming. It just, I don't know how you stop something like that. Like, it's a juggernaut that's going to get used any way it, it needs to. And, you know, what is partying? It's a, a conglomeration of a whole bunch of people. It's sexual. You know, it's going to, the, the pill is going to make its way to these sort of territories and zones. We just knew we had to document and, and, and talk about it in this film for sure. And not only just a party drug, but a huge asset for the porn industry, right? You, you go into that a little bit. Yes, we followed Quentin James. He's a porn star and kind of in the, the day in the life of Quentin James and how Viagra fits in his day. He wakes up, he sees his family, he goes to a porn shoot. We were invited onto this porn shoot with him and we see how Viagra is really the only thing that keeps him going through the day. Let's pop this and see. Thank you, Pfizer. Sometimes I like to... I like to chew it a little bit, give it a little. It tastes horrible, by the way, but... About 30, 40 minutes, you should be, like, in my bloodstream. I should be good, so... See what happens. Hope for the best. When was the first time you took Viagra? Do you remember? Oh. It was really the first time I took it. Because people recommended, hey, you should have a fail-safe. We were interested in diseases that led men to have trouble. In the porn industry, the disease is pretty clear. It's exhaustion. It's a different condition. It's not something I ever would have thought about. <laughs> it's funny how this was just a, we stumble across it, and it's like, oh, shit, and now it's a billion dollar industry. It looks like people need Viagra. So Viagra can potentially be the bridge between you either make the money that day or you don't. If I don't get hard, there can't be any scene. You're just going to waste everyone's time. As a porn star, you know, you have to have an erection for, these are, this is like a 12 to 14 hour shoot that he's on. I don't know too many men that can <laughs> kind of hold it together for that long. So for him, without Viagra, I think the porn industry, or at least his career, um, you know, I, I, I think it would dwindle pretty fast. He takes Viagra for every single porn shoot he does. He's been on over 500 porn shoots uh, in his career. He's, he's, he's young in his career. So he said without it, uh, the porn industry doesn't really exist for men. Um, without an erection, without what they call a pop shot, with, without the finish, uh, porn stars don't get paid. So it is that vital that he can make sure it's up or else the entire production goes away. What was that like for your production team to be on the set of a, of a porn shoot? It was interesting. It was eye-opening. Eye it was something new. It was extremely professional and, and, and well handled and, and just taken care of. We did have all access. We were allowed to be wherever we wanted as long as we don't jump in front of their cameras. Jump just felt like flies on the wall of any professional doing their job. They take it serious. They have fun. At the end of the day, they, they go have beers like everybody else. It was, it was, uh, it was really interesting. Um, but I, you know, I'd say it, what I was fascinated by was sort of the timing of Viagra and when he had to take it and, and how he sort of has, has always structured his day based off of what he ate that day. And he, he sort of knows how to make Viagra part of his work day, which is pretty, pretty wild. Would you say that was uh, one of the most interesting locations that you've ever filmed at? <laughs> I think it might be the most interesting <laughs> location I've ever filmed at. <laughs> Top three, and I jumped out of an airplane with a, with a camera. I've, yeah, I, I mean, yes, yeah, it was, it was definitely in the top three I've ever, ever been on, for sure. Describe a moment in the film that you found particularly disturbing or moving, and what was it about that scene that was especially compelling for you? You know, I do think the hyper-masculinity stuff hit me harder than I thought it would. I thought, like, this is a joke, this is funny, oh, there are a lot of men who, who do get hit with this, and then sort of understanding some of the marketing and, and how you're putting a lot of pressure on a pill, but, you know, a funny joke or a, 
a, you know, an ad or, or anything, you don't really realize probably at the time how it might affect the way that the world looks now, um, the way that we have status in culture and the way women look at things and men look at things. So we we're very aware of that. We had a, a, a great female story team as well. We had a very mixed group of people making this film. Um, that was that was just really important. And so I, I don't know if disturbing is the right word, but we had a we had a huge focus on making sure that it wasn't just told from a white male's perspective. That we got a lot of different opinions in on this, uh, and I think we did it very successfully. We had one interview with a sex counselor therapist, and he, he described uh, Viagra and how it sort of has worked its way into the ED community. He said he still, to this day, through something called franktalk.org, a website that he sort of pushes people to, to if they have any problems with erectile dysfunction, he still gets multiple suicides a year from that. And that, that was really hard to hear. Just men who don't feel competent, who don't feel like they're men who can't get it up and think that the world revolves around that. Uh, still to this day is losing men. And it got really emotional during that and that, that subject. If you can't function sexually normally, you're not one of the guys. You're not normal, you're broken, you're defective. There must be a sense of what's the matter with me and it must be so dispiriting. I know I've been in scenarios where uh, it's a little deflating that the penis that I would like to interact with is deflated. As a woman, you feel like I'm not enough what's the matter with me? There's no good uh, ending to this scenario. Everybody feels like they're to blame. If you've never been there, it's profound. That causes depression, and then so people have untreated depression. On Frank Talk, the search term suicide, 26 pages of guys we lose about one man a year on Frank Talk, and that's the ones we know of. I've had guys email me saying I'm going to kill myself and I'll call the cops or the hospital. Often too late. If there's any kind of message out of this is, yes, we have fun. We definitely go there with the jokes. We try to explain the science, but also, there, you know, there's an there's an avenue for people who are really hurt by this, and 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 it's an issue, and there's ways to get help, and that was that was a big part of of what we wanted to make sure we got into this film. What surprised you most while filming Viagra, the little blue pill that changed the world? I think the science surprised me the most. I think understanding sort of how the erection even comes or how how it works, it's it's way more complex. I thought, you know, you take a pill and, and then it's just up and then it just goes away. And it's, there was something before that maybe blocked that or or maybe it was an anxiety or a stress. And and here we go. But the, a lot of stuff and a lot of complexity happens. The other thing, not to give the whole film away, but sort of made by mistake. Um, just understanding that in science, mistakes can happen and it's about taking advantage of them. Um, you know, chance, chance favors the prepared mind, as we said in the film. That was kind of an interesting part of Pfizer is putting billions of dollars, billions of dollars into researching and developing drugs and something comes by mistake. Uh, you know, you can leave the world up to chance sometimes. And what do you want audiences to take away from this uh, docuseries? I think I want the audience to understand that science discovery is important uh, it can change the world, but also there was an element of the world changing science discovery. There was a moment in time in 1999 where a pill changed the world. It was called Viagra, but it's because the world was ready for it. I think that pop culture has as much of an influence as on science at this point as science says on pop culture. And that's, that's huge. It was a huge impact and, and really interesting to see. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's a fascinating journey of how shape and color and advertising and all these elements can actually make pharmaceuticals work. Uh, it's not just a discovery. So I think that's what I want to take away. Um, not all pharmaceutical parts of the industry are complete evil. Some are, are out to, to do great things. Sometimes there's evil elements as well. And we, we wanted to make sure we 
we've touched on some of that. Some of the patent work that Pfizer did is, is a little touch and go. Uh, I just wanted to see the life and times of Viagra. And, and, and I think it's an interesting ride. And you'll enjoy it. Is there um, anything that you learned during the process of making this docu-series in terms of you as a filmmaker and, the, and your process and, and the uh, crew that you put together? I think the crew being diverse, I think the crew having a difference of opinion sometimes. It's not just a director-led film where you have you know, a couple guys that you've worked with your whole life and you guys are you have the same mindset and you go and it's comfortable. This had a, a whole bunch of different people and not just Americans. We did this with October Films and, and uh, a lot of a crew from the UK. Um, I just liked the diversity of opinion on this one. And I think it was really important. I think it's an extremely sensitive subject when it comes to sex. It's probably the most sensitive subject. Uh, and you need, to, you need to get you have male, you have to have female. Um, you need diversity to, to want to tell this one properly. Thanks so much for coming on to talk about the docuseries. As you said, it is a serious subject, but your approach, your nod to 90s pop culture, and the humor you injected into the docuseries made it both interesting and watchable. I hope everyone tunes into Discovery Plus to stream Viagra, the little blue pill that changed the world. Thanks for having me. It's, you know, it's a fun documentary. In the end, you know, we want serious subjects, but we also want to have fun and be entertaining and and that's sort of the point. It's, it's a real story. And I, I really hope people learn something from it as well. And, and, uh, and, you know, go tell their friends to go watch it as well.